Brain injuries affect every aspect of your life. And through the journey, it can be really hard to advocate for yourself, especially when your cognition is affected and you're feeling overwhelmed. And so today we are going to talk about resilience and self-advocacy and even returning to school after a brain injury with our special guest, Callista Souza. There is always hope and you are not alone. Hi, I'm Christabel Braden, and this is my brain injury podcast, Hope Survives. Here, we share information, education, and support for the brain injury community. This is an uplifting podcast to bring hope to your darkest days. As a survivor of traumatic brain injury and multiple concussions, I know what it's like to struggle to find hope. I don't want anyone to feel as alone as I did. And that's why I started my online community called Hope After Head Injury. This podcast is an extension of that, and I'd love to invite you to join along as we explore the realities of life with brain injury with messages of encouragement, interviews with doctors and professionals, and survivor stories. No matter where you're at on your journey, there is always hope. Welcome back to Hope Survives Podcast. So glad that you are here with us today. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today we've got a very inspiring episode ahead. I'm interviewing survivor Callista Souza. She has experienced a brain injury from a brain bleed when she was 16, which led to brain surgeries and to a shunt and to having to reintegrate and return to school after her brain injury. She dealt with a lot of symptoms, including mental health struggles and memory loss and for forgetting things and being overwhelmed. And she's going to share a lot of that with us today. Um, there are a lot of pieces of her story that are really relatable and one of the things that I just find remarkable about her is she is so resilient. She talks about advocating for herself and the strength that she has to be able to say, hey, I need this. I need help. Like, I can't do this the way I used to be able to. And it's really inspiring how, how she was able to advocate for herself. And we can learn a lot from her. Um, one of the intriguing parts of her story is that she was born with achondroplasia, which is a form of being a little person. Um, so she shares that very early on in the interview. I think it's like the first question I ask her, she starts talking about um, that. And she shares later on towards the end that because of being born as a little person, she has been used to having differences in accommodations and needing to ask for help and that accommodations were not new to her and self-advocacy was not new to her. But after the brain injury, she kind of had to shift how she applied self-advocacy and accommodations. And so it's just really interesting to hear her story of resilience. And she's really, really funny and inspiring. And um, I think you guys are going to really enjoy hearing her story. Um but for a lot of us with brain injury, self-advocacy and accommodations are new to us after the brain injury, and it's hard to advocate for yourself. And when I had my brain injury, I was 14, and I had to return to school, and I remember feeling very displaced, and I remember feeling embarrassed by my brain injury, and I didn't want the other kids to even really know about everything going on or when they did know I was being bullied. Um, I actually went to two high schools because the high school I was attending when I had the brain injury, 
I had gotten bullied so bad that we actually, my parents switched, uh, we moved and they switched me to a different school in a different state um, that had a better special ed uh, program for my IEP. And when I went to the new school, I repeated a grade and I didn't want anyone to know about my brain injury. I kind of tried to hide it, but then people just thought I was weird. <laughs> oh man. But, um, yeah, there's a big part of brain injury that involves advocating for yourself and whether you are returning to school or trying to return to school, um, or whether it's the workplace or in your relationships, I hope that this interview encourages you to advocate for yourself. She, um, something that stuck out to me while I was editing this, I actually just finished editing it right before I filmed this. So she said something about how in college she got really used to the tutors and she probably knew them a little too well, the tutors at the library, which I think is so fun and funny that she was able to just kind of laugh, laugh about that. Um, you know, and she just knew that she needed help and she wasn't afraid to go for it because she didn't want to let anything stop her from moving forward in life. And, um, yeah, that's just really encouraging to me. And so, I hope you guys enjoyed today's episode. Thanks for being here at Hope Survives Podcast. We're a couple episodes in, back from my break here in season three. She was actually one of the first ones I recorded, though, and you'll hear me say that towards the end. Um, I have learned a better rhythm and routine and system for recording these episodes and editing them. And so hopefully, prayerfully, I will be able to continue bringing them to you on a regular basis. I really, really love doing this podcast. Would love to invite you, as always, to join me on Zoom. We have Zoom support groups Tuesday night at 7 p.m. once a month. Our next meeting is October 8th. It's usually the second um, second Tuesday. And then we have Brain Injury Bible Study, which meets uh, one Saturday a month, which is actually this week. So you can sign up for both of those at hopeafterheadinjury.com. Again, thank you so much for being here, and let's get into today's interview. Today, I am so excited to welcome Callista Sousa to Hope Survives Podcast. Welcome, Callista. Hi, Christabel. It is a pleasure to be on here with you today. Thank you so much for coming on. So Calissa and I connected over Instagram. Um, you sent me a couple messages and we got to chatting on there and you shared a little bit of your story and I'm really excited to have you on the podcast today to get to share with our listeners. So do you want to start by introducing yourself a little bit? Yes, I am 25 years old and I live in Minnesota and right now I'm actually going to be going back to school next week. I'm going to start with my CNA because I realized with being a patient several times, one from being a little person and then later for my injury, there's something about the medical field I just love. And I've been like reception and scheduling individual, but I realize I want to get more in depth with and just be able to help them more because I feel like my time is limited with trying to get them checked in and all set for the appointment. So limited time and they love chatting with me, which I'm more than willing to hear anything they have to say. Cause I know having a support system makes all the difference on patients' experiences. So I'm a little anxious about that because studying is not easy for me. Oh, what does CNA stand for? Certified nursing assistant. Nursing assistant. Okay. That's Trust me. There's so many medical abbreviations. That get to the point <laughs> There's where a like, lot. Yeah. I just figure I just ask, uh, yeah. these, even no, especially if our listeners might not know as well. Yes. Um, so do you want to share a little bit about like your background and growing up? So, uh, I'm the middle of three and, uh, born as a little person. My, it was, my parents didn't know until after I was born because still love the doctor to this day, still keep connected with him. But when it came to ultrasounds, I think they not thought nothing of it because there's no family history of achondroplasia, the type of dwarfism I have. So they kept prolonging the due date. My mom is like, the kid has got to come at some point. I'm not going to be pregnant for a year. And actually I was like two to three weeks early. And it was like shortly after being born, they were like, oh, she has achondroplasia. And then I was taken to Children's Minnesota shortly after being born just to keep an eye on 
and everything. And then within being six months old, I had surgery on the back of my neck just due to it's I I've been told the reason why I have it is sometimes like my balance or just the strength of the neck, it's just best to it creates more airways. So I can basically say I've been a patient since day one and hasn't ended since. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. So um, you had a brain injury as a teenager. So do you want to share a little bit about how you got the brain injury and what that journey has been like? Yes. So um, I was 16. I actually just turned 16 like a few weeks prior And, uh, it was the last quarter of my sophomore year. And I was always that kid that was always willing to get up early. I don't know why, but I love being an early bird. And it was one morning where I did not was, uh, the radio was still playing and mom came downstairs because she thought it was weird because I'm always up and at it. Like it drives me nuts when I'm like running behind or whatever. And she went to turn me over because I was still in bed. She was like, that's weird. Her radio is playing like the alarm part. And she's not getting up. So she turned me over and saw that I was unresponsive. And she yelled for my dad. He came running down. They called 911. 911, the ambulance took a while to get there. We still don't know why to this day because we gave him an address and everything. And we live out in the country, but we still gave clear directions because we share a double driveway. So we're always like, it's right in this area. Like, it's the house you can't see. And they still ended up going to that house. My brother had to run over and I was unaware of all of this. Like I couldn't tell you any of this that happened. And they finally got me in. My mom wanted them to take me to children's Minnesota and Minneapolis. And they decided not to, which in the end, my mom realizes it was probably the best decision because then they got me stabilized and everything. Because when they got me there, I've been told that that the nurse was trying to, or the doctor was trying to talk to me and I wasn't like waking up or anything. So they instantly were like, she needs to do a CT scan, see what's going on. They found bleeding on the brain. And then they instantly were like, take her down to children's ASAP. So got back in the ambulance and went down to Minneapolis and I did an MRI and everything there just to make sure nothing else was wrong. So Probably by the time my mom went to go find me, it was probably six in the morning. And then I finally had surgery to remove the bleeding and everything around 3.20 on that day. Wow. And I was there for 18 days. I had to do, um, started doing physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech. And speech was for, I sounded fine talking, which a lot of people say, but I always have to say it was memory wise. Like I would have it where... I was obviously because I just got done actually with braces a year before. The reason why I say that is because I'm particular about my teeth. It turns out I would brush them like four times in a day and still think I need to brush them again because I couldn't remember doing it that day. And then the lights, they I was not a fan of those. So they had to keep like the shades in and everything. And I just preferred it being dark because my head was so such in pain from recouping and all of that. And I was in there for 18 days. And I had a shunt placement due to my cerebral fluids not going down after the bleed on the brain. And they're not sure what caused it. Wow. That's scary. What was it Mm -hmm. like for you when you started the rehab and you realized what had happened? I think it was a lot for me to wrap my head around. Like for the longest time when I was in the hospital, my parents were the best. Like I look back and I keep reminding myself how blessed I am to have such a good family because they took turns being there every other day where I was told by the nursing team because I was there later for other surgeries, which I'll talk about. um, I always had a nursing team being like, your parents are amazing. There's other people that, sorry to say it, they have to keep working or they don't, they can't make things work to be there for the child. So they were like, they went above and beyond with trying to be there for you and everything else. And they were always by my side or whatever. But anyways, the reason why I say that is because one of the times I guess my mom was going to the restroom and she came back and I was very sassy, which is I've always been sassy even before the injury. And I was like, where have you been? And my mom, like, of course, like dear nurse that got to know me pretty well. She's like, honey, she's been here the whole time. (laughs) But of course, my memory, I'm like, where have you been? Like, (laughs) I've been all alone. She's like, I just went to the bathroom. (laughs) Yes. She's like, oh, I was just away for a moment. But a little sassiness came out of me, I guess, too. 
I can tell I very I barely I don't remember really any of it. Like I bet you I can remember probably not even five percent of the whole stay. Yeah. And I say that because I remember moments here and there. Like turns out oh, I got tried taking care of myself. I need to go to the bathroom and I guess I forgot about the service because of course it was nighttime. So parents are sleeping like they're there. So I don't say anything. I'm like, oh, I can take care of myself. I'll get out and go to the bathroom myself. And the next minute turns out they got in there and they were like, uh, what are you doing? Like you need to ask for assistance. So that just shows how unaware I was of it for that 18 days. Yeah. So what happened after the hospital stay? Um, I did not return back to school. The first, the, well, the, it was only the first day I showed up and it was that night when the injury happened. So, um, I still had to do, um, outpatient, um, physical therapy, which I didn't have to do that one as long, but I still just needed to gain strength and everything. And then OT just to be able to do tasks in speech was the longest. And that lasted basically all summer because of my memory, not always being sharp or like they would ask me to recite something after doing a different task. And I could never, I couldn't always get it. And then I started school up that junior year, which was a lot, made me very anxious. And I kind of did too much to myself for the first day. I didn't lay down at all because that's the biggest thing that I need. I needed to do during that summer is that's another reason it was a very low key summer because whenever my head was hurting, I always was laying down because that's the only way I wouldn't feel the pain or the pressure. So the first day of school, I thought I was fine. And by the end of the day, I was like, mom, you were picking me up from school. Cause of course, um, the injury happened. I was 16. I was planning on getting my license later that summer. Cause I just wanted to focus on school and I didn't get it until a year after I didn't even get back on the wheel actually until a year after the injury totally happened. And luckily I can say now I'm doing a whole lot better. Like I don't really have head pains at all, but it was just a whole long recovery of of advocating for myself, saying that my learning isn't the same. I had to get, I had to ask for an IEP again, which is an individual education plan to offer me accommodations and all that, because I had it where I tried taking chemistry and the teacher was like, I was asking her questions and she's like, you know this. And I literally looked at her and I was like, I do not know what you're talking about. Like, I, I hear you talking, but I don't understand any of this. Yeah, but good for you to have the confidence to advocate for yourself. What encouragement would you have for other survivors that like are struggling with knowing how to advocate for themselves or speak up for themselves or communicate their symptoms? Mm-hmm. I would say just not, I guess, be upfront, like be honest and be like, hey, like this isn't working. Like I'm honestly not understanding this. Like I had it where some of the teachers were more than willing to help me. Like they had like, blocks you know to get prepped for the classes or to see where they were like with grading and everything and there were certain teachers I knew I could always go and find them during their times of being available to help me and actually work with me one-on-one so it definitely makes all the difference sometimes the teachers aren't going to be the most willing or I think they struggled with understanding that I may look fine but my brain doesn't work the way it wants was like, you're going to have to walk me through stuff more or talk things out with me more. Like I even took, I really wanted to take a classic novel with one of the teachers that was very well liked. And he went above and beyond helping me outside of class. Like, to be honest, we like discussed like tests and then he would give me like half credit back if I didn't score as high Mm -hmm. to like help boost me up. Because sometimes during the tests, I kind of just did it on the spot and it was just a lot better when he discussed and I had gained a better understanding besides just staring at the paper. That's great. So going back to school after the brain injury, um, was a lot. Can you share like what a lot of your symptoms were? Like, can you list off some symptoms that you experienced? Yes. I would say headache was a lot of it. Like I could tell I really couldn't stand or move. And as I said earlier, laying down was like, the way of having no pain. Like even sometimes if I stood up too quickly, I would sometimes feel dizzy and just overall feeling fatigue. Like I had to start setting a routine where once I got the IEP and I think even before that I had to be like, I'm laying down, like I'm going to go down to the nurse office. And sometimes teachers were more than willing. They were like, that's fine. You can leave beforehand or whatever to lay down in between classes. And I also wanted to do it because it was high school. So sometimes the hallways are chaotic and people are loud. So 
I would want to be dismissed early too. So I could get to my next class and not deal with the craziness of it all. Yeah, so. I did that too, uh, in my IEP. So I was also, um, in my sophomore year, but I was 14 when my brain injury happened. And when I went back to school, I did all the, I did a lot of similar accommodations as you. And one of them was leaving, I would leave before the bell rang so that I could yep. walk down the hallway without the other students. Yes. Um, so I could get to my next class safely. Yes. And I think sometimes too, like, obviously, like, as I said earlier, like, I can put on a good show of looking fine. So even if it was loud or whatever, I obviously wouldn't plug my ears or whatever, but I could definitely tell that made such a difference. But yeah, I had to do it where I had to like push and be like, I'm going to go lay down. And I even had a teacher that was like, do you for sure need to lay down right now? I'm like, "Uh, uh-uh. I'm not doing this again where the first day happened and then my head hurt. And that's another thing too, is I don't think a lot of people realize how much I wouldn't even do homework at home. Like I would have to ask for extended time. Because even though I survived the school day and I looked fine and everything, by the time I got home, sometimes it wasn't even all the pain. It was just the fatigue of doing so much in a day. Yeah. But I look back and I'm proud of how I went through it all and how I handled it. Because looking back now, it's amazing what I all could do, even though it wasn't the easiest. Yeah. Yeah. So you shared with me an article about your story from, is that from the children's hospital you went to? Yep. They did a feature story on you? Yep. Um, It's it's really wonderful. And in the article, they talk about how it also, the brain injury recovery affected your mental health. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes. I would say with, like, I became more quiet. Like, I've always been an outgoing girl, and I think I still am, but I can still... Like, I won't be so chatty all the time. I think just sometimes after the injury, like, I just like low key time and just be able to reset myself. And I think during it, like, sometimes the pains were constant and I felt like it was never going to end. So I think sometimes I just was always self aware of myself and I never was the best at saying stuff. So, and I think a lot of anxiety too, or sometimes as soon as I would get the head pains, I automatically would start thinking because I actually had head pains. I forgot to mention the night when it, I actually went to bed that night before the injury or before they found me unconscious Mm -hmm. and I had a really bad headache and they gave me medicine and my mom, I think they even, I don't remember this, but they offered to take me in. And of course I'm that overthinker where I'm like, even before the injury happened, overthinker where I'm like, I am going to be showing up there and they're going to be like, it's nothing. It's just a bad migraine because I thought nothing of bleeding on the brain. And so I think just with that, whenever I would get head pains, I would always freak out. Like I had it where I'd be anxious at night where I literally wouldn't let myself go to sleep uh-huh. until I felt no more head pain. So I think just the anxiousness where I was like, I did this once where I let it kind of go so I could sleep and then look where it turned out. Yeah. And then just the anxiousness of not being able to remember stuff like school was made me very anxious. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why I'm a little anxious right now. But I've learned though, too, if you don't make the move, you're going to find yourself regretting that you didn't take a step towards a dream, just because you're going to let something hold you back, like your memory or learning differences and everything. Well, and what you just shared about the anxiousness of the, um, you know, for you, it's the head pain going to sleep. But a lot of people who've had TBIs from falls, they're constantly scared they're going to fall again. I I experienced that so much because I got so many concussions and I would always be so anxious that it was going to happen again. Um, and I have had a lot of setbacks. But through them, I've had to remind myself too, like, I've done this before. If it happens, I can do it again. I mean, I'm going to try for it yeah. not to, but you know, there is a piece of like resilience in there, I think, of for every survivor that we keep going. And, you know, with the anxiety and with the depression, like you're still going another day. And Mm -hmm. that takes courage. Yes. And I finally, uh, I actually shortly after the injury, I tried doing therapy. And let's just say it wasn't a good connection. And I did I kind of regret what kind of therapy like talk therapy yeah okay and I kind of regret because I kind of backed out after that because my mind kind of was like okay I didn't go out with this person 
obviously I'm not meant for this or I can't do therapy because they didn't listen or understand. Like if anything, they put stuff back at me and they were like, well, maybe you're just overthinking this. And I'm like, this is <laughs> not so helping frustrating me. It's frustrating because you can't see it on the outside, right? Like, yes. Yeah. Oh, so my. finally, this last year, I finally was like, Kosa, you need to do this again. And that's why I actually, I was off of Instagram for a while and I started up a new account. I'm trying to get better at posting. But I think the biggest thing I gained from the injury is I love being on one-on-one with people like in the presence. I feel like sometimes you're able to do that on social media, but at the same time, it's totally different. Like you're not talking mm-hmm. with people, but I'm trying to get myself to open up more. Like I posted about anxiety, how photography helped me through the recovery and everything else. So I'm just trying to be more open and honest because I realize keeping it to yourself doesn't help. And I realize more and more other people have anxiety. Yeah. Everyone does to an extent. Yeah. But especially, yeah, I think brain injuries, it offers a unique experience, you know, for each person, but also like you said, like the, there's that feeling of what if I get injured again, but then there's also the, what if I can't do it? (laughs) What if I'm not going to get back to how things were before? What if this never gets better? You Mm -hmm. mentioned earlier, you said something like you, you thought that it maybe was never going to end. And, um, that's they hard. Finally, mm-hmm. And I was saying that because luckily with my shunt, it was more of that afterwards. It wasn't really the head pains from the bleed. It was from the cerebral fluids being too high. Okay. So and you got a shunt put in. Yes. And then later that August, because it turns out my surgeon thought it was going to be temporary just due to the situation. He just thought it was maybe like a fluke thing. Like he thinks either that could have caused the bleed or it was just a blood vessel burst. But anyways, I got it. We tried removing it in August and then turns out with the removal, he saw a lot of cerebral fluid. So they put um, an external clamp in to keep an eye on me. So I thought it was just gonna be a one day deal and I should know with myself, I really shouldn't plan anything. I just fly from the seat of my pants now. (laughs) Like I realize planning isn't always the best, but I ended up staying in the hospital and got it placed back in. Cause it turns out I needed it more than we thought. Cause I had it tuned all the way up. Mine was one of those where you set it and the highest it can go is 200. So I got it put back in and then I still had head pains and fatigue and everything. And then going in my senior year, I was like that summer, I'm like, I'm not going to have a normal life. Like at this rate, like I'm not going to be able to do college or if I do, it's going to be exhausting. Like I'm only going to do a few courses at a time. So luckily my, uh, certified uh nurse practitioner and my uh certified neuro registered nurse I was gonna say the abbreviations but I know no one's gonna they're gonna be like what does those mean they were very advocate like I always could reach out and call them and be like hey like things are still not right I'm still having head pains and everything else Mm -hmm. so with it being a year they didn't want to remove the shunt due to the tissue damage it could cause so this time they just clamped it and I've had it luckily clamped ever since and I've been fine ever since which after a while I got a little anxious after that too where I was like if this clamped and all of a sudden I have the cerebral fluids go up again Mm -hmm. are we going to be back on page one again and do this all over again so I think sometimes just being observant on myself but also realizing close to your healing like you're getting better like Mm -hmm. this is long it's a long recovery right yes it's slow and it's long I had to learn to be really patient with myself which wasn't always (laughs) easy and I still kind of do where I'm like, well, what about this? What about that? And luckily my neuro team, even though I really don't have any in-person appointments, they always are like, you can call anytime you want. Like if you have a question or just want to talk with us, because they saw me through a lot. Like I know not everyone's like this, but I feel like they're like my additional family, I guess. Cause they saw me through and through, like they saw me at my weakest yeah. Points. And I wasn't the most probably nicest patient because I don't remember much of it. <laughs> but just they saw me through it all. And it makes a difference. Like I feel like even though they only got to know me because I basically between the surgeries and all of that, that was a year, year and a half. So I'm like, I feel like you know me like a book now. Well, and it's been nine years since all yeah. this happened. It'll be, so uh, 10 in April. Okay. So it's been over nine years. Mm-hmm. Um, and so for those listening that they're hearing you talk back on your experience on, you know, from the other side, sort of saying like, Hey, I went through this. This was really rough. It was a long experience. Um, 
but now you're going to school, you're doing things. Mm -hmm. Uh, What encouragement would you have for someone who feels like they're like in that place right now? I think what I really had to do was take things day by day, but also realize too, like, like things are possible. You just, um, be patient with yourself. And like, I think just knowing, like, for instance, like I did go to school, just knowing the connections and just gaining all that experience made me realize, like, if I want it, I'm going to push myself and I can do it. It might just not be the easiest, but as long as I ask questions and get the support I want, like I got to know the tutors pretty well in the library, probably a little too well. (laughs) Well, that's I would just good go every day you, after classes. Well, what I keep hearing from you is you have always been able to admit when you need help. Yes. And that's something I think a lot of people, they, they struggle with admitting when they need help. Even, I mean, when I was in college after my TBI, like I knew I needed the accommodations, but sometimes I would try and push through without like mm-hmm. using all my resources just because I'm like, I can do it, I can do it. And then I just crash and burn like it did not work um and so it's like but I I keep hearing a thread over and over in your story I keep hearing threads of you being resilient but that your resilience comes from admitting you need help your resilience Mm -hmm. didn't come from pushing through and acting like everything was fine like that's not where your resilience came from your resilience came from hey I need help can you please help me do this? Yes. I'm going to tell you what I need and I need you to help me with yes. this. And I think a thing that kind of helped me too, I don't know if you would say it's an advantage because um, I've been working on, hopefully at some point, I wasn't going to say this, but why not? I'm thinking about writing a book because I've been working on it because I realize there's so much I don't know. And, but I also realize if I'm amazed with my own story, cause I don't remember all of it, I can only imagine what it will do to touch other people. Like I love reading my medical records. It's probably really weird, but like, I love reading it. Cause it just shows well, me. Well, it like, started when you were born. I was. Yeah. But with writing and all that, but I had my teacher that was like, cause we were discussing cause we meet like every once in a while, because I sometimes realize talking out with somebody makes all the difference for me like me jotting stuff on paper. Like sometimes I read stuff back out loud. I force myself to read it out loud because if I just keep reading, rereading it just in my head, I'm like, that does not make any sense. That sentence that we just need to rewrite that whole thing. But anyways, when we worked together, he mentioned to me because he was the one I had for classic novel. We just stayed connected ever since. And he's like, I think with you being a little person, the achondroplasia, I think that gave you it didn't make things easier for you, but it made you more willing to face the facts of what came along with the head injury. And I'm not always the one most willing to admit or talk about myself that way, but it really created a picture in my mind where I'm like, I really think that did hmm. made it make a difference. On Why do you think I, so? I think there was a lot that I had to face with being a little person. Like I got bullied and all of that. And I even had it where I made sure to never like take advantage of being a little person. Like one moment that still sticks in my mind from elementary is when it came to Fayette, I got accommodations because they, I couldn't run as fast or whatever. So I had it where I only did half the mile because the teacher had known me forever. And he was like, you only need to do like two laps. So everyone else would do four. And all I said was to these group of girls, because I got done a little beforehand just think about it. If I did the whole thing, I would have like still been gone. I wouldn't have finished when I did. But all I said was good job, ladies. And they, without, I didn't mention anything about me running less or anything. And they were like, great for you to say, like, you didn't even do it all. And I'm like, wow, I literally didn't even say anything about not having to. You were just trying to be nice. Yes. And like, be like, Hey, way to go. Cause I know it's not easy. Like, you got to try to keep up and keep running for the whole time because you want to get a decent time. So I think that just created a picture for me. And then just always willing to be everyone's friend. Cause I noticed sometimes not everyone was like that towards me. Like I look back now, like I was such a floater when it came to being friends, I was willing to be friends with anybody. And I didn't really let anything block like causes for not being friends. Like I was always willing to sit by whoever because I knew school wasn't easy and sometimes having friends wasn't easy either. So 
Yeah. I just always wanted to be there for people even before the injury. And also, um, you know, you've been, so what you're saying is that because your whole life as a child, you were already used to having accommodations in different ways that when you had the brain injury, the idea of accommodations or advocacy wasn't new to you. No, if anything, it was just a new way of using it. But I think the one thing that's different I will admit, sometimes with being a little person, I'm not the most willing to ask for help. Like I've had past okay. jobs, they're like, why are you not using a stool? You're using a chair. You're, you could possibly slid off. And I'm like, oh, sorry. But like, I think with uh, the brain injury stuff, I knew if I didn't ask, I was going to struggle in school. Like yeah. I would probably not do as well. I'd probably not flunk, but not score as well or gain an understanding of class. I think I would have just been going through the motions. Yeah. Where I think I knew it wasn't easy for me. So I wanted to make it better for me because I always have loved school. So, and I knew I had to ask because it wasn't obvious. Like I always say it's an invisible injury where I'm sorry, I say it when you see somebody with crutches or whatever, you're not going to be like, yeah, run the mile where with this, it's like, <laughs> let's just take the test. And it's like, I don't even know what this is all on. Like I may have yeah. been in class every day and I had perfect attendance for the most part, besides when I have my appointments, but I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Cause the memory loss. Yes. Yeah. Is that something you still uh, deal with? A little bit. I would say I'm definitely have those proud moments. I will not lie to myself. I won't, I don't like boast about it, but I'm like, yes, I remember this. <laughs> I have that too. <laughs> like I laugh though sometimes cause people are like, like my mom, I love her dearly, but she's like, plus I remember this for me. I'm like, you're asking the one that's memory is like, not 100% reliable to remember this. And sometimes I'm like, yes. Or two, like, I think I've always been an eager talker. And I would definitely say I get that from my mom. And my mom got that from my grandpa who recently passed and had cancer. But I think sometimes I'm too eager to talk. And I'm always worried I'm going to forget what I say. Kind of like with this interview, I think that's why I was anxious for this. Because sometimes I get a train of thought. And then all of a sudden I'm like, crap, I literally got to this whole story. And now I don't even know what I was going to say. And it's like, I know it's a good point. So I think I've had to learn too to be patient, but also be like, Clissa, I remember it. Like, you don't need to like just budge in a conversation or butt in or whatever. Just wait for your turn, which it hasn't always been easy because it can easily slip my mind faster than you yeah. think. Well, t- and taking the pressure off yourself and giving yourself grace in those moments. Um, yes. So, yeah, I mean, I love, I'm, I'm so inspired by you, Calista. Thank you for sharing. And I think, like I said earlier, what I see in you is just a lot of resilience, but resilience that comes from asking for help and realizing when you need help. A lot of people view resilience as just trying to be strong all the time, you know, mm-hmm. whereas I think that it actually comes from admitting when you need help and being able to recognize um, what's going on, but also not giving up the hope yes, that I things are going to gonna keep that. going. Yeah. The biggest thing for me that I think people thought like it was like, cause I've had the word resilience be brought up a lot, which sometimes I think I struggled with. Cause I'm like, what the heck? Like, this is not easy. Like, you think I'm having a fun time doing all of this? But I think looking back, I'm like, I kept going. I like kept going with no force. Like it was like, yeah. as if I felt like life was trying to stop me in some ways with the injury. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm still in control here. I'm going to, we're going to get this done. That's encouraging. So as we're getting ready to close, what are your final words of hope that you would have for our listeners? I think kind of like what I've said before, be patient with yourself. Like I think the hardest part for me during the injury is I would obviously, I talk to my neuro team even more during the recovery because I literally would be like, why am I experiencing this? Why am I experiencing that? And they were like, listen, this takes time. Like, or I'd try to ask, I never liked when they gave me this. I'd be like, well, how is this like for every people? Like what's that on average? And they're like, listen, we don't tell people because every injury is different. I'm like, come on, just give me like an average here. Like I want something to go off of. And they're like, listen, we don't know for sure. And even I guess like my parents were kind of anxious when I had the first shunt placement Cause they were like, she was doing so well, everything else. Like they thought like I was done and good. They were like, why give her another surgery? And one of the doctors was like, this surgery is going to be nothing. It's going to be a piece of cake. And turns out too, like shortly after being, before being released, they were telling my parents, like everything was up in the air. Like my parents really knew nothing after I was being admitted there. Like they didn't even know for sure that I was going to speak, talk, walk, 
or any of that because, and I think sometimes too, it's, you never know what's going to happen. And I think they knew they had a 24 hour minute time frame. So I think they just wanted to resolve and remove the bleeding before they could say anything else. Yeah, that makes sense. It was very much on a time crunch because it the headache started like eight eight thirty that night, and then surgery was three twenty. So it was really time crunch. And people may not think it was urgent, but they did a lot of tests. They had to make sure like other things weren't wrong, or they did all the testing they could before they open me up and then find more stuff. So definitely had to gain patience for myself, and I think that's just a big thing to help. And also just seek for help. Yeah, I think looking back, I wasn't always most willing to talk about myself because I don't think I was self-conscious, but I always tell myself too, I don't remember much of the story. So I think sometimes people are like, well, I had no idea. Like there's certain people that are like, I had no idea any of this. And I'm like, well, it's not something I like brag about or I don't want people thinking poor me because I think I noticed with being a little person, I always got that. Hmm. in some ways so I just didn't want to face that or struggle with explaining it like I never could straight up tell my story on what happened because I didn't remember much of it it was a lot of reading medical documents and asking my family a lot of questions well that's really encouraging thank you for sharing and um, I'm sure we could keep chatting for a while, but we have come yes. to a, an end. And literally, here I feel like time. the best friends, Christabel. <laughs> like I literally was like so excited. I was like, "What the heck? I don't even need to do an interview. I think I could just talk with her." Because <laughs> you listen to the podcast, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, oh well, your episode will be coming out. I'm soon. so glad I found it. I don't even know how I found it. I found a few other ones too, but I was like, "Dang, if I had to pick one podcast to start with, we'll start with Christabel and see where that oh. goes. <laughs> see if <laughs> it's a." Uh, keep going or also don't do that again. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, I'm so glad you were able to be then, on. Yeah. I'm so glad you started doing this. Thank you. Yeah. I had to take a bit of a break for my own health and things that were going on, but we're back okay. and I'm so glad to be back. So, um, yeah, thanks for being one of my first guests back on, uh, Podcast an honor. Yeah. Trust me, I've been excited. First podcast in this new space. So yeah. I'm still working on the decorations. So it might look different every episode <laughs> oh my for the people who watch it on YouTube. I might have to start watching. I've only listened to the podcast. So yeah, I'll I have most of them on uh, video on YouTube. Some of them okay. I like just had segments and um, I didn't get to editing all of them, to be honest. But um, I'm trying to get in a better rhythm and routine with it. So they yours will be on YouTube. Well, it, feel, it probably feels like as soon as you're done. Because I don't know how long it takes you to edit. You feel like by the time you're done, you're like, wait, now I have another interview set up. Yeah, and it I takes a while. I still have to post this, yeah. but like, I haven't. Yeah. I get so. that. Like, you want to finish before you start the next one. I think that's a big thing I've noticed with myself, too. It's hmm. don't push yourself. Like, finish a task and don't overwhelm yourself with more. <laughs> I need to learn that. <laughs> well, if you need anybody, I'm here to support you and tell you. <laughs> I can learn a lot from you, Calissa. Oh, I'm here man. Too, girl. Um, yep. All right. So we're going to go ahead and, and end the episode here. Thank you so much for being here. So if people want to get in touch with you, um, is Instagram the best place for that? Yes. And I'm hoping at some point maybe start more like website and then okay. maybe like hopefully that book come out. But yeah. So it's at Calista Sousa, right? Yep. I'll put it in the I'll put it in the um, description. Perfect. So. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, it's been great having you on. Thanks so much for tuning in to Hope Survives Podcast. Make sure to subscribe and stay tuned and would love for you to consider leaving us a rating or a review. Check out hopeafterheadinjury.com for more. I'll see you next time. And remember, there's always hope.